Okay, up to this point, we've been looking at some chemical reactions where we've been generating some compounds. We've looked at some reactions like single and double placement reactions where we've um, we've managed to watch some reactions occur by exchanging of the partners within these ionic systems. Today, what we're going to do is we're actually now going to try and use our understanding and knowledge of solubility and ions and reactivity and so forth. And we're going to try identifying ions. <clears throat> Rather than doing this quantitatively, figuring exactly how much, like we did with the KCl reaction, what we're actually going to do here is we're actually going to look more at a qualitative perspective. Basically, we're going to identify what is it. So the first thing we need to do is understand what kind of test we're running here. And we're going to be looking at what we call the silver nitrate test, which we already know from solubility, silver nitrate tends to react with a lot of things to create precipitates. We're going to undertake a barium chloride test, which is somewhat related to that, but shows the presence of different ions. And then ultimately we're going to use organic solvents to help us understand the presence of halides and other related systems. And we're going to be using cyclohexane in this case. You can often use decane for that step, but we're going to use cyclohexane here. And so we're going to work through this lab. You should already have a table um, of the common ions, which are on the right here. Notice we have like sodium bromide, sodium chloride, sodium phosphate. These are basically all so common sodium salts. And the reason we use those is because generally those group one ion systems are soluble. Remember that from your um, double replacement systems and double displacement understanding. And then on the right here, what we, I'm sorry, on the left here, what we have is we actually have our main reactions that we're going to use for the testing, the silver nitrate, the hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, and so forth. So we have everything out that we need. And then on top of that, at the very back, what you can see, see the bigger bottle and the smaller one here, those are two unknown systems. And once we have full data for all of these sodium ions, what we're then going to do, or sodium systems, I should say, what we're then going to do is determine what that anion is for those two unknown systems so that we can at least like show that we can qualitatively understand what these ions are based on a reactivity with a common set of reagents. So given that we are dealing with some kind of nasties here, uh, we're dealing with silver nitrate, which we've talked about before, can, is toxic, can stain your hands. You've got 6M hydrochloric acid and 6M nitric acid. You've got chlorine water. I mean, all of those are toxic and corrosive and definitely don't want to get on your skin. So gloves, once again, the order of the day. I mean, as a general rule of thumb, that's what we would use anyway. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to focus in a little bit more on these test tubes. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set up a system. We're going to do one of these tests at a time. The first one we're going to run is going to be the silver nitrate test. So we're just going to pull the silver nitrate into view here. We're going to add approximately two mils of this to each of our test tubes. Since we're going to be comparing all of these sodium systems on the right here at the same time, we may as well just out put the same two mils in every single test tube to start with so that that way we can just make this as efficient as possible. So we're going to use these dropping pipettes. About halfway up is about two mils. This doesn't have to be precise, but it would be good to have about the same amount for each one. So that's what we're going to try and do here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to put silver nitrate in each of these systems. We need six test tubes to test the six sodium salt systems. And then we need two which are at the back. We're going to use those for our two unknowns. And since we're going to be comparing those at the same time, we should do that. We could do them at the end on their own, but that wouldn't make sense. Since we have the re reagents out for the standard testing, we may as well do our unknown testing at the same time. That's just good lab efficiency. So now we have approximately two mils of silver nitrate in the base of each of those test tubes. You can see the heights are just about the same for every test tube. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add each of our sodium systems in turn. And here's the order we're going to do. We're going to do the, the halogens first. So we're going to do the bromide, the chloride, and the iodide. So we'll do those three first. And we're going to see what happens as we add each of those to our system. So we're going to make note of this. I'm just going to get a marker pen. So this first one is going to be labeled bromide, BR, 
for our, to remind us this is sodium bromide. Then we're going to label the second one Cl for chloride. And the third one is going to be I for iodide. Let's do those first. So we're going to get a clean pipette for these. And we're going to add about two mils of the bromide to the bromide test tube. And what you can see there is as soon as I add that, You can see that milky, remember this before when we did the double displacement reaction, when you see something milky forming like that, chances are you have a solid inside of an aqueous or a liquid system, in this case aqueous since both systems are aqueous solutions. And we're going to let that settle out so we can take a little closer look at that solid, but you can definitely make a statement as to what you see as you add each of these. So when we add the sodium bromide, that's what you see. Now we're going to add the sodium chloride to our silver nitrate. So you can see there, as soon as the first drop hits, it looks pretty similar to what you see with the bromide. So I'm going to just give that a little shake there, put it back in view for you so you can make a note as to what it is you think you see. And we're going to leave that. And then the last of the halogen systems we're going to add is the iodide. So we're going to try and put the iodide in shot for you. So I'm using the same technique as before, right? Where we have the mouths of the two systems are close together. You just can't see me adding it. So I'm just carefully going to add a couple of mils. And again, you can, you can make your observations to what you see here. I'm trying to add it slowly so you can kind of see things as they form and as they happen. So I think you can get a pretty good sense as to what you see there. I'm going to give it a little shake here. I think you definitely get a clearer picture as to what happening, what is happening with that little shake. So that's our first three. So we added silver nitrate initially, and then we added sodium bromide, sodium chloride, and sodium iodide to each of those systems. And you can see what happened when we did that. In the final three of our knowns, we're gonna add sodium sulfate. Then we're going to add sodium carbonate, and also, sodium phosphate. So those are going to be the final three adds on this known system. So I'm just going to move these two out of shot. We're going to start with the sodium sulfate. And we should probably, before we start doing this, we should probably label. So we're going to call this sulfate, so SO4, and the carbonate. You should know these polyatomic ions by now. These are a really important part of the first course of chemistry that you take, especially high school and college level. Knowing those polyatomic ions will save you a ton of time down the road and will help you with a lot of these kinds of experiments. So we're going to take the sulfate now. We're going to add it to that initial sodium, sorry, a silver nitrate that we had in there. So we're adding sodium sulfate here. Again, I'm going to add it slowly. All right, so we've added two mils of sodium sulfate now. And you can make your own observations. I'll give it like just a little shake here just to see if that helps anything. So 
So you can see now that versus what the system originally looked like, just in case you need a comparison here. Okay. So that's the sulfate. Now we're going to add sodium carbonate to the next one. So that's the silver nitrate in the bottom of the test tube, and now I'm just going to carefully add two mils of the sodium and carbonate. I think you got a pretty good idea of what happened there. All right, I'm just going to give it a little shake. Just make see if that makes things any more clear for you. All right. So take a careful look at that test tube. Look at the sides of the walls as well as the liquid itself. See what's happening inside the liquid too. So you have good observations as to what you see when sodium carbonate was added. And then finally, we're going to add sodium phosphate to the final test tube. slowly add it again down the walls so you should be able to make observations now when you're making your observations be sure to make sure you're noting not just whether you see liquids gases solids solutions mixtures nothing at all but make sure you make note of colors too now if you see a distinct color being formed you should definitely make a note of that because that's very important in chemistry and in this particular lab, you definitely are going to end up having to use color or potentially having to use color in order to determine the presence of specific ions that is dictated by color of all things. So if you look at our first set of reactants here, what we have, we just bring that in just a little closer. So if we take a look from left to right, this is the bromide one over here. So you can see there that clearly something has happened. Remember, make a note of what you see in terms of solid liquid gas, but also make a note of colors. You also might want to make a note of how much you see. So for example, if I compare the bromide to the sulfate, right? If you think that something is formed in that, you may want to talk about how much you see, right? If you look at the one on the right, the sulfate clearly isn't as much in there as there is in the one on the left. So when you're making those observations, the other aspect of it is to sort of know approximate quantities. It doesn't have to be like there's 1.3 grams, but you might want to make a statement that there's a lot or there's not much or there's just a tiny amount. or So it sort of go like a small, medium, large kind of scale and make a note of how much of what it is you see. When we look at the chlorine on the sodium chloride system with silver nitrate, clearly there's something in there as well. So you might want to make a note of color and quantity as well as what you see. Again with the iodine one. The color may not be quite as clear in this video as it is in person. I'm going to say this color is probably a little more yellow than maybe what it shows. So just giving you that as a sort of small heads up. The sulfate doesn't seem like it's quite as significant as the other ones, but there's clearly something in there that you should talk about. The carbonate. Again, you can talk about what you see, and you can be specific too about where you see it. Like in this case, you can see a lot of stuff's congregated at the bottom. It's sort of aggregated out. You can talk about that as well as systems where you find that it suspends a lot more. So these are all really good observation points. And then finally, we're left with the phosphate. And I think you can clearly see the color and the solids that are in this one.
So this is the phosphate one. So that's our six known systems. Now at the back, we have two unknown systems. So we're just gonna push this back a little bit. We'll zoom back out so we can actually watch the addition a little bit better. I'm now going to add unknown A, which is the bigger bottle, and unknown B, which is the smaller bottle. I'm going to add unknown A to silver nitrate. Remember, we put two mils of silver nitrate in these ones at the back as well. And I'm going to add this in shot for you as well so you can see what happens when we do the same thing here. All right, so unknown A added to silver nitrate. And that's what you see. So we want to really compare that against each of those systems and see if it matches any of them. So we'll give that a couple more minutes just to make sure nothing else happens there because we noticed on some of ours that while a lot of them were immediate, not everything was. And then unknown B we're going to add. So silver nitrate, so this is our unknown B vial, uh, test tube, sorry. We're gonna add that carefully. And clearly when we add unknown B, something clearly happens. So you wanna make a note of that for your unknown B. I'm gonna give it just a little shake to see if anything pops up on the walls that we can talk about more. So if you look at that, you can see that there is clearly some things on the wall of the, of the test tube. And then once we get a sense of how that reacts, we can come back and we can compare that to the other systems. So let's look at unknown A. What we're gonna do is we're gonna zoom in so we can compare unknown A fairly capably with these other systems. So looking at it from left to right, clearly A, it, unknown A doesn't, require, doesn't correspond to any of those first three. It's a possibility it could correspond to the fourth one, but it looks a little more clear than that. But we can keep that in mind that it could potentially be a sulfate anion in there. And clearly it doesn't match either the carbonate or the phosphate. So the anion in this system, if it corresponded to anything, most likely corresponds to the sulfate and not the other five. There's clearly no significant comparison to those. Then if we take a look at unknown B, now you got to think about what it is you're looking at, you're looking at whether or not you see solid liquid or gas produced, you gotta think about colors, you gotta think about how it's suspended or settled out. So if I take the bromine and put it next to it, it's possible, right? I'm gonna tell you that in person, the bromine one looks just a little more yellow. There's the chlorine one which looks pretty close to, but again, in this case, the B looks just a hair more yellow. I think you can make your own judgment about the iodine one. If you compare it to the sulfate, compare it to the carbonate,
and then compare it to the phosphate. So you can draw your own conclusions, but you should be able to like remove, I'd say at least, I would say at least three or four of those right out of the gate. There's a couple where you might say, eh, it could be. So unknown B, you can probably narrow down to one or two possibilities right out of this. So make your deductions as to which ones you think could be B. And this is why we use more than one test, because sometimes there's a little ambiguity in all of this. You know, it's possible that it could be one of two. So I want you to draw your conclusions here, and then we're going to start running the second test. So I'll just hold them up here for you for a second, so that you can take one last look. A is on the left, B is on the right give you a chance to think which ones it could be like. Then we're going to move on to our second test. Once we've got our silver nitrate in place, because of the ambiguity that sometimes happens with silver nitrate, the silver nitrate test, as you can see, generates a lot of very similar looking systems. So what we do is um, we do a secondary test to go with this. What we're going to do now is we're going to add about three mils of the 6M nitric acid. So we're going to pull this video back out. Now what we're going to do is to each of our systems, we're going to add a 6M nitric acid. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the bromide one I'm going to add six, uh, about three mils of 6M nitric acid. I'll give that just a little shake. So you can see some changes occurring there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let that one sit around for a little bit. We'll come back to that. So we've added this, the 6M to the bromide. Now we're going to add it to the sodium chloride system. Just a little shake. So if anything happens, that it happens fairly quickly. So I'm sorry. As as that, give that just a few seconds there, and you can kind of see what the initial reaction is. And we're going to come back and look at these in just a moment. We're just going to add the six M to each of them. So now with the iodide. And it's good to look at it immediately after you add or while you're adding and then to look at it again a few minutes later because some reactions are not instantaneous. They don't just take off right away. And so you've got to give them a chance to happen if they're going to happen. So with the iodide. So again, we're going to add about three mils of the nitric acid. We're going to give that just a little shake up so if the reaction is going to happen, it will. And then we're going to leave, so initial look, something like this. We'll come back to that. We have our sulfate. Sulfate the first time around wasn't the most exciting test tube. Let's add the 6M nitric acid, HNO3. See what happens in the sulfate. So initially after adding and then if we give it just a little shake. All right. Then with our carbonate, same again, three mils of nitric acid. And I'm adding this fairly quickly because there are things in there. I'm trying to like stir it up a little bit as I add it. 
So if you look at the nitric acid, this is kind of an interesting one. And you can probably hear that too. So looking at this now, you've got some observations you should definitely be making. So in the carbonate one, you've got some observations you should be taking. I'm going to give that just a little shake. That's the carbonate one. And then finally, phosphate. So when we add the phosphate, you can see some changes there that you should be noting. I'm just going to put that in a rack. I'm just going to put the cap on the nitric acid here. One thing you need to be careful with nitric acid. Does go off a little bit of a, a vapor and odor. It's something you want to avoid inhaling, so I'm definitely going to cap that as soon as I can. So let's take a look at these systems and see what happened. So this is A, so this is the bromide. It definitely looks different. I want to take your observations of that. Just to let you know, the solid in the bottom, it's kind of hard to see the color of it. It's a slightly off-white color. It's like a pale yellow. The chlorine kind of looks similar. And in the bottom, that solid is definitely a brighter white. You can probably almost see the difference between the two if I hold them next to each other, but on their own, it might be hard to see the difference in that coloration. The iodine. I think you're still seeing the same kind of setup here. It's kind of like both the bromine and the chlorine Adding the acid may not have made a great deal of change, it just might have cleared things up a little bit. But it's up to you to know what you see now, because now you can see these things a little more clearly. I'm going to hold all three together so you can see the differences between the three. See how in this case now the bromine almost looks like a hair green in its hue compared to the more white on the chlorine and the slightly more yellow on the iodine. So it's bromine, chlorine, iodine from left to right. We look at our sulfate. You can make a note of any changes you feel you see there if you see any. The carbonate now. Remember the reaction you probably already noted here. And those bubbles are kind of a residual of that. But you can now make the changes or make the observations what you see in here. Now we've added the nitric acid. And then with the phosphate. You're basically going to make a note of what you see in there right now. So now we understand what happens with our standard systems here, at least sodium systems. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add nitric acid to our two unknowns. So we're going to add it to A first. Let's make a note of this. Sorry. So we're going to add this to A. Make a note of any changes you see in A at this point. And then we're 
we're going to add it to B. Remember, unknown B looked like it could be one of a couple, so hopefully the nitric acid here will help us isolate which it really is. So hopefully you made a note of what it looked like initially, which ones it could have been. Now we're going to add this. And I think what's happening right now should be a dead giveaway as to which ion, which anion is probably in this system. So I would say at this point you should be able to identify unknown, unknown B's anion. All right, I'm gonna put that in the rack. Just give it a minute while I close up the nitric acid. And then what we'll do is once again, we'll compare our unknowns A and B to our known systems. And so if we look at these, take a good look at what these look like and then look at the rack behind them and think about which of these they look most like or they reacted most like. So I think the A and B here, A is on the left, B is on the right. You should be able to get a sense of what ions could be A and B. All right, so at this point, we're done with the silver nitrate followed by the nitric acid test. So what we're going to do is we're going to get a new rack of test tubes, and we are going to follow with a different test. We're going to use the barium chloride test. So let me just get a new rack of test tubes here. I'm just going to move them in. Here's one I prepared earlier. And just like we did before, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to label all of our tubes. So we're going to start with the bromine. We're going to then go to the chlorine, iodide, sulfate, carbonate, and phosphate, and of course we have two unknowns in the back that we're simply going to label A and B. Now we have our test tube rack all set up and ready to go. We're simply going to add the barium chloride to the bottom of each one. So we're simply going to add two mils to all eight test tubes, so that way we have the same starting point for each of them. Notice how I keep the mouth of the jar close to the mouth of the test tube I'm going to put it in, so that way I'm less likely to drip barium chloride solution in this case all over the bench. I do my best not to touch the side of the test tube, but occasionally it can't be avoided. So now we're set up with eight barium chloride systems. We're now going to work our way through adding each of the sodium salts. So we're going to start with the sodium bromide like we did before. So this is sodium bromide. I'm going to try and add it very slowly so you can see any reaction that might occur. So adding sodium bromide to barium chloride, give it just a little shake to see if anything else happens. This is what we have in here right now. So 
So you should make your observations if there are any. We're going to add the sodium chloride. All right, again, if there are any reactions, you should do it. Note it down. If not, you can indicate that it stayed colorless and clear. There was no apparent reaction. And finally, we're going to add sodium iodide. Again, make any note of any reactions. We'll give it a little shake and see if anything else happens. And we'll come back and look at all of these again in just a moment, but we just want to make sure we get these working. So the first three honestly aren't particularly exciting so far. Next we're going to add the sodium sulfate. So the sodium sulfate, this is with barium chloride, remember. Give it a shake to see if that helps add any clarity to it. I'm going to leave the sulfate to sit for a little bit, but you should be making note of what you saw happen when that was added. And then finally, we have the sodium carbonate. I'm not quite fine, we still have the phosphate to go. And here's our carbonate. So again, it looks like something seems to be happening, so definitely worth making a note. And finally, I'm going to add the sodium phosphate to our barium chloride. Once again, you should probably be making a note of what you saw occur there as I added. I tried to add a little bit slowly at first so you can see anything as it occurs. A couple of little shakes just to see if it needs any help in there. Hopefully that can give you some clarity as to what you see happening inside that system. Remember to note the sides of the test tube walls. When you look at the sides of the test tube walls it gives you an indication, especially if solids are formed, it may not be obvious. Like If it's a solid that's well suspended, kind of like the solids in milk, it's kind of hard to see it or it just looks milky and you're not sure but if you shake it and see those solids come up on the side of the wall so if we look at this phosphate one is a good example when I shook it I do that on purpose now if the solids in there they often get left behind on the sides of the wall as the liquid layer comes back down and you can see that very clearly here so I'm gonna give this one away and say there is some solids in this one and you can see that and you know that simply because of what you see on the wall there so if we zoom in a little bit on our rack here. We can clearly see the bromine, the chlorine, and the iodine all together. Not particularly exciting, so your observations on those ones should be pretty straightforward. 
When we look at the sulfate, the carbonate, and the phosphate, though, now clearly things have happened here, and your eyes don't deceive you. That middle one looks like it has a little bit of color. If you can tell what color that is, that's good. It's actually kind of a pinky purple color. So that's worth noting. Notice how this one looks versus how these two look. It's the same thing going on probably, but just notice that the agglomeration is a little different in the sulfate one. So now we have our six standards that we worked with the barium chloride. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take our two unknowns and we're going to add them to the same system. So we're going to take our unknown A and we're going to add it carefully to the barium chloride. So adding our unknown A to barium chloride gives us that as a result. We'll come back to that in a moment, just do a second review on it and compare it to our known systems. Then we're going to take our second unknown, unknown B, and we're going to add that to the barium chloride. Give that just a little shake so we can see how that looks. And we'll give those just a moment to finish reacting. We'll zoom in just a little bit so we can get a better look at this. So now you can probably see the coloration over here just a little better. So let's take our unknown A. All right, so unknown A using the barium chloride test compared to bromide chloride iodide compared to sulfate carbonate and phosphate. And then our unknown B compared to bromide, chloride, iodide, and then compared to sulfate, carbonate, and phosphate. We probably already know B, so you can probably already pick that one out. A starting to settle out pretty well right now. So I mean I think obviously it's similar to one of these three. So it's a little hard to see them all together in shot. So I'll put the sulfate back. So it could be the sulfate, could be the carbonate based on this test, or it could be the phosphate based on this test, right? Any one of those three would be viable at this point, I think. But remember, we're not gonna rely on just one test. We've already done the test with the silver nitrate and the nitric acid. So that's actually two levels of test. And then we've now got a third level of test using the barium chloride. So between the three now, we should be able to start narrowing down what our two unknown anions are in those two systems, A and B. But we're not done. We're actually going to follow through with one more part here. We're going to start using some organic solvents in order to determine whether or not we have a specific halide present. 
All right, so we're gonna move on to the third set. So we're done now with the Baron Chloridus, so we're gonna move that out of the way. And we need one more rack of test tubes, just to complete this out. And just like we did before, we're actually just going to add, this time we're gonna do it backwards as it were. We're gonna add each of our solutions in first. First thing we need to do is label all of these test tubes. So that's what we're gonna do first. So the same known six ions, bromine, chlorine, iodine, iodine technically, and we've got our sulfate, our carbonate, and then we have our phosphate, and then we have solutions A, and B at the back. So now what we're going to do is we're simply going to add two mils of each of our known ions to the front six, so the bromide first. Then the chloride. So then we've got the three halogens done first. Remember, halogens, group 17 or 7A on the periodic table. It's a good column, group of chemicals you should know. And we're going to add the sodium sulfate, sulfate SO4 2 minus, a polyatomic ion. You should definitely know by now. If not, you need to go home and learn those polyatomics right away. Carbonate, CO3, 2 minus. So you'll notice the ones that end with 8 have oxygen present, as do the ones with ite. And the first part of the name is the giveaway for the ion. So carbon 8 is carbon and oxygen. CO3, 2 minus. And then finally, phosphate. So again, got oxygen present and phosphorus. PO4, 3 minus. So this is sodium phosphate. So now we have our standard six done. We're actually going to go ahead and put our unknown in the back as well. So we're going to put unknown A into our unknown A. And of course, unknown B. to be so we've now got our six known sodium salt solutions in the front six test tubes and our two unknowns in the back what we're going to do is we're going to add an organic solvent in this case we're going to use cyclohexane often we would use decane for this but since we don't have any this is a Pretty good substitute. So we're going to add two mils of decane to each one. And what you're probably going to see is the same reaction in each one. So I'm not going to do anything too fancy here. You can make an observation as to what happens when we add decane to each of these systems. But I think you can see pretty clearly what's happening. Zoom in a little bit for you so you can see a little better. Maybe if I pull it out of the test tube bracket, it might be more clear. All right, so that's happening and is likely to happen with all of these systems. So I'm going to keep adding the decane, sorry, the cyclohexane to each of these. And it doesn't matter if we don't have exactly the same in each. What matters is that we have it present in a quantitative amount. So about equal amounts is good. 
and I'll show you the two at the back in just a moment, but you're going to see that they're the same as well. So we're done now with the cyclohexane. Since it's an organic solvent, they tend to be a little volatile. We want to leave that open for as little as possible. Here's the two at the back, and you can see they behaved exactly the same as all six bromine and chlorine. Iodine and the sulfate. Carbonate and the phosphate. So all eight things, when we added the cyclohexane, did exactly the same thing. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add chlorine water to each of these. And we're going to see if the chlorine water is able to react with them. Now chlorine water you definitely want to be careful with. You can get a little pressure build up and initially you might have a little bit of chlorine in the headspace above the liquid. So you want to keep it far away from your body, preferably in an active hood like this one. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add, so we're going to zoom in a little bit on here. And we're going to add the chlorine water to the bromine system. And we'll see if anything happens. Not too exciting. We'll come back to that. Now we'll add it to the chlorine system. to the iodine system. Notice in each case that it's the lower layer that gets much bigger. Since we're adding chlorine in water, that should tell you which of those two layers is water. Add the sulfate. and the phosphate. So the chlorine water didn't work quite as well to start with. So we've just added just a bit more to it. Now we can see a bit more clearly with we added a bit more chlorine where you can see with the bromine one, which is the first one. It's a little hard to see with this. There's actually a little coloration here. It's like a little, if you put a white cap behind it, you might be able to see the color of it a little better. See, it's colorless in that upper layer. I'm starting to see a little bit of yellow in that lower layer. When we add it to the chlorine one, there is really no change in the system at all. It stays colorless and clear on both sides. And we add it to the iodine one. You can see there's a distinct color change in that aqueous layer. So when you add the chlorine water, the three halogen systems, the chlorine one seems to stay pretty consistent. So it's bromine on the left. So you can just sort of make out that slightly colored hue to it. 
It's colorless in the middle with the chlorine, and then the iodine is obviously a much deeper color. So in terms of how much color, it seems like as you go down the halogens, chlorine, bromine, iodine, you get an increase in the depth of that color. So we're going to put the chlorine water off to the side because we've already noted this pretty corrosive stuff, so we don't want to leave that out in the open. But we're now going to add it to the other three. And we'll see if we see any change in the sulfate. It's hard to see, there's just maybe a slight change in hue, but it looks pretty much the same with the sulfate, with the carbonate. Again, no real, no real appreciable change there. And then if we add a bit more to our phosphate system here. We don't see any appreciable change there either. So the chlorine water decane is particularly useful when you're trying to separate the halogens. If you've noticed so far, the three halogen systems, bromine, chlorine, iodine, have behaved kind of as a group. They've all behaved one way or another way, but they've all behaved the same. So this is a way to sort of differentiate which of the halogens you have, if indeed you have a halogen. So if our unknown A happened to be a halogen, this would be a way for us to determine which halogen it is. So we may or may not have determined what unknown A is yet. So I'm just gonna add the chlorine water to it and see if we see any appreciable change there. And then we're going to do the same to B. And again, I think it would be fair to say there's no appreciable change there either. So if you use the chlorine water with an immiscible organic solvent like cyclohexane, what you're generally going to see is some changes in coloration in the halogens. Now if we go back to our halogens now so we can actually see it a little better. So I'm going to shake this up just a bit more. And that coloration that was originally in the aqueous layer is actually now moving up into the organic layer. Okay, you're forming a free halogen and that free halogen bromine prefers to be in the organic system. So what we're seeing here we're seeing just a little bit of a yellow hue forming in this upper layer. It's a little bit hard to see. The chlorine stays exactly as it is. As you would expect, chlorine probably wouldn't be displaced by chlorine. Remember we did this with single displacement? But now when you look carefully here, the best place to see what's happening is at the interface between the two liquids. If you look at that interface, what you can see is kind of like, that is not your eyes deceiving you, that's actually genuine color that we're seeing of a, like a purple hue that's occurring in that upper layer. And that's usually an indication of the presence of free iodine, which is in that, what you would see here. If the chlorine reacts with the iodine and displaces it, remember the reactivity series for metals and hydrogen, we also have kind of an equivalent series for the halogens. We know that fluorine is more reactive than chlorine, is more reactive than bromine and then iodine. So if you added a chlorine to a system, you'd expect it to displace the iodine. And that's what happens here. When it does, it displaces, displaces it as molecular iodine, I2, which in an organic system will appear, actually in a free system too, will appear like a, hue, a purple color. And that's what you see here. You can actually see it very clearly at the interface, but it's actually that whole upper layer now that has a purple hue. So what we're really looking for here with this test is whether or not if we have a halogen present, whether or not, well, sorry, if we have a halogen present, which halogen it is. And if we look at our systems A and B, if we believed there to be a halogen present in either of these systems, there's really only one system that it matches, right? I think that's pretty obvious. If we think it's a halogen, if it's not a halogen, then of course it can be like any of the other three systems and they all look basically the same. So we've now got a third test 
to couple with the rest of our information to figure out exactly what our two unknowns are. So this was the cyclohexane coupled with the chlorine water to see what happens. So like I said, that's really to differentiate between these three halogen systems. And we can couple that with our barium chloride test, which I'm just going to bring in front to remind you of that. So that's our barium chloride test, right? Remember what happened to each of those. So again, the three halogens reacted as a group. They all look the same. And then we have our three other polyatomic ions over here that came out a little differently. Now you can start to see a little more clearly A and B. Right? Now you might have a better sense as to which of these this this is the sulfate, right? This is our carbonate. And this is our phosphate. This is with the barium chloride. So when you look at those three, be careful not to draw too many conclusions from like the hype, but that is definitely a good indicator. Look at the colors and this like what it looks like. And if we go way back to the beginning of this experiment, we had our silver nitrate followed by nitric acid. So this would have looked like after the nitric acid. We had our two unknowns, A and B. And if we look at our two unknowns, and then if you start looking at each of these other six known systems, it starts to make you think which one it might be. So this is how you qualitatively determine an anion, in this particular case the anion of our system. And we use three tests. We use the silver nitrate coupled with nitric acid. We then used the barium chloride test and we finally ended with what is effectively a halogen test using the chlorine water with uh, an organic solvent. And from that we can then determine the presence of one of at least six different anions. And our two unknown systems at this point, you should be able to identify the anion in each system.